Good evening. My name is Hamilton Cravens, and I would like to welcome you to the third, and we hope not last, but the third funded uh, lecture of the Sperry and Hutchinson Foundation in a series called Science, Technology, Society. Um, in 1976, we had the first one of these um, lectures, and uh, this will be the last for the time being. The first speaker was Professor Carol Purcell of the University of California at Santa Barbara, who spoke on the political ramifications of centralization in American technology. The second speaker was Professor Arnold, Arnold Thackray, who spoke on the issue of whether science could, could be measured. <coughs> Tonight, our speaker is Professor Garland E. Allen, who teaches in the biology department at Washington University. His interest has to do with the history of biology, the history of scientific racism, the history of eugenics, and in the larger sense, the use and abuse, I think this is correct, of science as it affects society. Professor Allen attended the University of Louisville and also Harvard University, where he graduated in 1966. He has been a National Science Foundation fellow and grantee. He is the author of a biology textbook, oodles of articles, and two major books, A History of the Life Sciences in the 20th Century, and The Authoritative and Definitive Biography of the Mendelian Geneticist, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Professor Allen is currently working on the history of the eugenics movement in the United States with some attempt to compare it in, in its international context, and he's very concerned with the whole issue of the use of scientific theories as a way of naming and defining allegedly superior and allegedly inferior peoples. Yeah. Tonight, without further ado, I would, I would like to introduce Professor Garland E. Allen, who will, who will be speaking on theories of scientific racism, its history, and modern consequences. Thank you. I'll try to give you some very brief overview of what I'd like to do uh, in the few minutes that I'm going to be talking tonight. If there are questions afterwards, we can uh, certainly spend some time going into those. What I'd like to do is to focus on the issue of scientific racism to talk a little bit about some of its 19th century historical developments, and then in order to get into a little bit more depth, to focus on a 20th century example uh, that is the eugenics movement, which also happens to be a subject as uh, Hamilton told you that I am very concerned with as a part of American social, economic, political history. What do we mean by the term scientific racism? Uh, a few years ago, people were using the term biological determinism, and maybe you have run across that term at some point. I would use them more or less uh, synonymously. Whether you call it biological determinism or scientific racism, and if we want to call it scientific racism, we can really uh, expand that term to be scientific racism, scientific sexism, and scientific classism. By whatever name, this concept, these terms, refer to the attempt to use biology, science in general, but most generally biology, to try and account for the social, economic, behavioral, differences between groups of human beings. Throughout history, theories of scientific racism have attempted to explain poverty, the old dictum that the poor will always be with us, uh, is a concept, a generalization which requires, or at least in many people's minds, seems to require some kind of explanation. The existence of unemployment persistent failure of certain individuals or certain groups in the educational process, mental deficiency, social problems such as alcoholism, criminality, and so on. 
Each of these are recognizable social problems. Scientific racism, sexism, classism, biological determinism is the attempt to explain the existence of these social problems in biological terms. That is to root the cause of the problem in the inherited or somehow inherent makeup of individual human beings. Most theories of biological determinism or of scientific racism have attempted to explain some behavioral aspect of human beings by reference to an innate, though not necessarily a genetic, biological cause. Theories of scientific racism are by no means uh, something of the past. One of the reasons that I got interested in this whole topic as an aspect of history was because it seemed to me that from my knowledge of its history, uh, there were some things going on today that had a very uh, old ring to them. There seemed to be a good deal of deja vu. In particular, the theories of Arthur Jensen, beginning in 1969, claiming that uh, black people were genetically inferior in intelligence to whites, sounded to me at first glance awfully reminiscent of some arguments that were made in the 1915s and 1920s, in the teens and 20s. Theories that criminality is uh, caused in large part by uh, genetic or chromosomal aberrations, the presence of extra Y chromosomes and so on, was a theory that had a short-lived uh, but rather dramatic history in the uh, early 1960s. Today we hear a great deal said about a new biological discipline called sociobiology that is also, in my view, a very current example of a theory of scientific sexism and racism. What I'd like to do is to look at the nature of some of these theories in the past and to try to get, at the end of the talk, to some kind of analysis of what the appearance and the reappearance of such theories means in a larger social context. Let me start out by saying that to see the role of such theories in history does not mean that we have to deny that there are real hereditary differences between people or between subgroups of the human population. It is certainly true that, certain, that some human behavioral differences are rooted in physiology, which in turn are rooted in genetics, such as diabetes, uh, certain heart conditions, Down syndrome, Tay-Sachs disease. There's a whole catalog of clinically and biologically very definable human hereditary traits that affect human social behavior, what human beings can do in their society. To look at the, the historical role of theories of scientific uh, racism does not mean that we have to deny that such clinically definable conditions exist. But when the scientific or biological data postulating a biological cause for a very specific social phenomena, such as poverty or unemployment or alcoholism or criminality, when we find such theories postulated to explain those rather specific social conditions. The historical point that is of great significance is how those theories are used in their social context. In the 18th and 19th century, theories of, of, of social uh, scientific uh, racism became quite popular. They have existed all the way back to the time of the Greeks, by the way, and Plato uh, himself was one of the inventors of the perhaps what might be called the first theory of scientific classism at any rate. But Plato was honest enough and he called his theory a noble lie. And it was that human beings are born made of different metals and that it is important that each person learn what the metal uh, is of which they are composed. And if they're composed of iron, they should behave as iron. If they're composed of silver or gold, they should behave as silver or gold. But Plato called it a lie because he knew it was necessary to use the theory not as a means of scientific or natural truth, but rather as a means of simply trying to hold things to the status quo. But it's really in the 18th and 19th century that we begin to see some of these theories taking what in our terms might be a non-metaphorical role. Plato's noble lie was a metaphor. It wasn't literally true in anybody's mind that human beings were made of metal. But in fact, by the 18th or 19th century, theories of the 
actual biological cause, not simply a comparison, uh, became prominent. As slavery grew in the 18th and 19th century, a debate raged in the a community of natural historians and savants about whether the newly discovered uh, non-white races of Africa, the Indian races of uh, South America, were the same species as the uh, white Caucasian European. Uh, a number of naturalists, Linnaeus, uh, Louis Agassiz, Thomas Jefferson, uh, people who were uh, in our terms perhaps uh, some professional, some semi-professional, some just educated uh, naturalists, uh, came to the fore and debated this issue. And the general consensus for uh, a considerable period of time was in fact that the two groups were, the whites and non-whites, were separate species, and that in fact the separateness uh, was the result either of separate creations, of pre-Adamite uh, creations, and so on. In the mid and later 19th century, it became obvious by a number of criteria that all human beings were really members of the same species. With the rise of the growing emancipation movements that were beginning to develop in Europe, that is for the emancipation of slavery in various European colonies, a new justification was picked up for trying to explain, in a sense, why the blacks race, in particular, should be regarded not as an equal of the white. Human races, it was said, existed in a hierarchy from the most primitive to the most advanced. The argument was based upon a growing field in the early to mid 19th century known as anthropometry. Anthropometry meant literally the measurement of the human being, uh, the attempt to get various kinds of data, measured data, about the structure of the uh, human anatomy. One of the most interesting, how do we turn off the lights? Is there a One of the most interesting kinds of comparison that Europeans first uh, became infatuated with was the obvious, in some ways, physical likeness of the apes, uh, the primates, to, uh, and the focus does not, the remote focus doesn't, doesn't work. I guess there's a little knob on the front of the, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the, uh, we may have a very anti-racist uh, uh, slide machine back yeah, there. Uh, this, this figure, which came from about the 1850s or so, showed the obviously uh, biased view in the drawing comparing a, uh, a, an orang to a female uh, black from Africa. And the comparison, the drawing, as you can see, is obviously exaggerates similarities in a way, uh, I'm bet you we can get it focused, that shows uh, the kind of thinking uh, that was prevalent in making these comparisons. It was obvious that the blacks, uh, to uh, white Europeans, it was obvious that the blacks resembled the, uh, the anthropoid apes. Now, anthropometry, however, tried to go beyond this kind of simple or facile comparison. It attempted to measure the differences and therefore give them precision and apparent scientific authority. One of the most common methods of measurement was with uh, the so-called facial protractor, which was a means of measuring facial angle. The lower part of the protractor was placed under the chin, and this part of the protractor adjusted to go up the slant of the face. And from that, measured along the arc, you could get, that still isn't a very clear focus, but I guess it's, you think it's the best we can do? I can only, the, the remote control only puts it out of focus. <laughs> I don't seem to bring it back in. Uh, at any rate, you could get a measurement of an angle, and then that measurement of angle could be used to compare different groups to one another. Here's one of the uh, simpler examples from uh, the date is about 1850 again. <coughs> Uh, that shows the comparison of this simple facial angle 
Okay. The uh, facial angle, it showed the kind of thing that the European uh, investigator uh, found very satisfying. And that was that the more sharp the angle, the more anthropoid the facial uh, structure, and that the white European had a almost uh, vertical angle, whereas the uh, black had a uh, much more uh, acute angle. And it was found that if you ranged the various subgroups of the human population along a line of facial angles, that indeed the white European came out uh, the furthest in facial angle from the, uh, uh, the anthropoid apes, and the black came closest. And that, again, was very satisfying in terms of uh, going along with basic kind of uh, social and hierarchical assumptions. Now, as some biologists and, and zoologists pointed out at this time, that if this was true, uh, is this, uh, this argument should apply throughout the whole phylogeny of the animal kingdom. There should be some relationship between uh, facial angle, not only just among the primates, but in fact, if you carry it on down into other species as well. The simplest biological explanation of the significance of this facial angle was not merely that it was a measurement that differentiated one group from another, but that it was a measurement that reflected the shape of the skull, particularly the frontal lobes, where the center of reason was supposed to reside, and therefore, the sharper the facial angle, the less frontal lobe, and therefore, the less brain uh, material and uh, the less cognitive power. Well, indeed, if one uh, looked around through the animal kingdom and arranged the phyla in uh, representatives, at least even of the vertebrates, uh, along a kind of line, you could get everything from a fish with a virtually horizontal facial angle uh, up to a white European with a vertical uh, facial angle. And you got a very nice series. As, as any zoologist knew, uh, that you could equally well pick any number of other species uh, in the middle of that. And, uh, that uh, array, and they would not fall in the place that you would hope they would. So this is a very select uh, arrangement of phyla. But it nonetheless showed the kind of thinking. Uh, the searching for a biological correlate to justify already existing uh, social hierarchies. Now, the anthropometry movement, which became very prominent in the latter half of the 19th century, attempted eventually, as it really got going, to measure any and everything uh, about uh, the human uh, frame. It would measure every conceivable part of the anatomy, and from this generated table after table of data. And if you read the anthropological, anthropometric papers published in this period, uh, you'll see just endless tables of figures. But this gave to the movement a sense of, of the precision of science, of the authority of science, and there was a great deal written uh, on this subject in the 1850s, 60s, uh, and 70s. And we could go into great length. I'd, I'd love to spend more time talking about the anthropometry movement, because it really has some fascinating aspects to it, including uh, a, uh, the work of at least one great American anthropometrist, uh, Samuel G. Morton, uh, which, as uh, one a biologist, historian of science, as uh, Stephen Gould has shown in the last couple of years, uh, managed to fake a good deal of his data, perhaps unconsciously, but in fact to so load the measurements that he was taking that it showed exactly what his preconceptions uh, intended to show. Uh, the whole anthropometry movement was very interesting, and also, again, something we don't, I don't have time to talk about right now, but uh, the whole argument was applied in male-female differences as well. And in the 1870s, uh, especially in England, when movements for women's emancipation, for women's admission to higher education uh, was a hot topic and a hot parliamentary topic, uh, the London Anthropological Society began to generate large numbers of papers uh, using various kinds of measurements. Uh, first facial angles, then various other kinds of uh, measurements, head to body weight, body size, and so on, to try to get measurements that would show that women were biologically inferior to men, and therefore to admit women to the universities was, in fact, uh, to upset the order of nature. Such arguments were used in the United States, particularly to show that 
uh, black people should not be emancipated uh, that, uh, in fact, the emancipation movements were going to so upset uh, the social structure that, in fact, it would be deleterious to everyone concerned. Louis Agassiz, the great American biologist and zoologist in 1869, argued uh, from data much as what you see here uh, that Negroes' brains had smaller capacities than those of whites. And he said, there is no more malicious practice than slavery, except perhaps the doctrine that all men are equal, in the sense of being equally capable of fostering progress and advancing civilization. In terms of social policy, Agassiz went on to say, let us beware of granting too much to the Negro race or, uh, in the beginning, lest it become necessary hereafter to deprive them of some of the principles which they may use to their own and to our detriment. Now, it's interesting, Agassiz was probably one of the most renowned and well-known zoologists uh, in the United States at that time. He was surprised and somewhat uh, perturbed to find that his arguments and his conclusions were picked up and used by Southerners during the Reconstruction era. And he was even profoundly hurt uh, when he was called by one abolitionist, a racist. But nonetheless, Agassiz's preconceptions, his presumptions, uh, his assumptions, whatever term you want to use for them, in a sense dictated the kind of biological evidence on which he was willing to rest a conclusion. The thought process was very clear. The social hierarchy was natural. The function of biology was to show why it was natural. The most profound theory of scientific racism in the 19th century, I think, was that which was called social Darwinism. It was originally uh, a, a movement and a concept which emerged from the writings of Herbert Spencer. His great American proponent was William Graham Sumner at Yale University. Popular in the period from about 1880 till the very early 1900s, Social Darwinism attempted to apply the Darwinian theory of natural selection to the structuring and the history of society. The basic argument of social Darwinism was that in the social sphere, as in the natural biological sphere, organisms compete for scarce resources. And the competition means that those who succeed rise to the top of success, either in the animal community or in the human community. And those who are unable to compete or less successful sink to the bottom. Such a theory explained the existence and persistence of social and economic hierarchies, and in fact suggested that to alter those hierarchies by such things as legislation or uh, charity was in fact to go against the order of nature. To help those who were unfit survive was as unnatural as for an organism that was incapable of competing in nature to be somehow protected and allowed to further its kind. Sumner pointed out clearly how the biological doctrine of natural selection could be used to justify a certain social order. He said, the millionaires are a product of natural selection acting on the whole body of men to pick out those who can meet the requirement of a certain work to be done. It is because they are thus selected that wealth, both their own and that entrusted to them, aggregates in their hands. They may fairly be regarded as the naturally selected agents of society for certain work. They get high wages and live in luxury, but the bargain is a good one for society. There is the intensest competition for their place and occupation. This assures us that all who are competent for this function will be employed in it so that the cost will be reduced to the lowest terms. Sumner went on to say that social legislation to aid the poor or unemployed is destructive to society. Let it be understood, he said, that we cannot go outside of this alternative. Liberty, inequality, survival of the fittest. Non-liberty, equality, and survival of the unfittest. The former carries society forward and favors all of its best members. The latter carries society downwards and favors all of its worst members. There is, of course, one fallacy in social Darwinism that makes the application of the biological principle uh, to the social sphere uh, irrelevant. And that fallacy is a very simple one. Fitness 
who is fit and who is less fit, in Darwinian terms is judged by one and only one external criterion. That is what's called differential fertility. Those organisms are the most fit who leave the most offspring to the next generation. Those offspring are, those individuals are less, least fit who leave the least offspring to the next generation. Now, as everyone was quick to point out in studies that were made around the first decade of the 20th century, that in fact, by that criterion, the wealthiest of society were the least fit. And the poor were the most fit, because family size almost had an inverse proportion uh, to social and economic status. In fact, it was a matter of great concern, both in Great Britain and the United States, in the early years of the 20th century, that the poor were seen as outbreeding the wealthy. And the term race suicide was coined to express the strong concern of usually the uh, white and wealthy sectors of society that they were being continuously out and increasingly outnumbered. Social Darwinism was an inappropriate metaphor, analogy, or biological explanation for the class and racial and economic structure of society. But it had a very widespread popularity in uh, both England, the United States, and some other European countries in the uh, last decades of the 19th century. It was against a background such as this, in which I've just discussed three kinds of theories of biological determinism. Uh, the notion of species differences, the notion of anthropometry to measure the differences between human beings, and the idea of social Darwinism, that in the 20th century, a yet another theory emerged. This was the movement that I'd like to talk about in a little more detail uh, called eugenics. The term eugenics was coined by Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin and an English biometrician, a mathematician, and naturalist and biologist of considerable merit. The term was coined in the 1880s, but it wasn't really till after the turn of the century that a movement based upon eugenics uh, got underway. What is eugenics? To Galton, it meant the attempt to use rational principles of heredity and evolution to guide the genetic or hereditary destiny of the human species. By that, Galton and later eugenicists and his followers meant selective breeding to encourage those members of society who had desirable qualities desirable qualities of physical uh, and physiological structure, but also of moral structure, to have lots of children, and to discourage or prevent those people who had undesirable traits from having many or any children. The concepts of heredity that Galton himself espoused in the last years of the 19th century didn't lend themselves very well to formulating a strict kind of scientific basis for eugenics. It simply wasn't possible to predict from knowing the hereditary past of any given organism what kind of offspring it might produce. But in 1900, Mendel's laws of heredity were rediscovered and were thrust and received somewhat enthusiastically, and in fact increasingly enthusiastically, throughout the scientific community. This was the first time that a really generally applicable theory of heredity had become available to biologists, and it was natural that for almost from the very beginning there were attempts to apply it to the human species as well as pea plants and guinea pigs and rats. Eugenics, as it became a movement starting in the early 1900s, around 1904 or 5, oh, by the way, this is just one other little theory of biological determinism or scientific racism I would throw in. It's interesting because this was from an article published in 1901 in the British journal Nature. There was an attempt to categorize uh, criminal tendencies in people on the basis of ear structures. Uh, what the, uh, the, the page here shows is the uh, basic uh, human ear 
the chimpanzee ear and the ear of a criminal. Uh, <laughs> and to show that the ear of the criminal had many more similarities to the ear of the chimpanzee than to that of the normal human population. And the article was replete with photographs of hundreds of ears <laughs> of these variety of types uh, and so on. Only problem was it turned out that a large number of members of the British uh, aristocracy had ears that represented the chimpanzee type. And the theory didn't gain much favor uh, after that recognition was pointed out. Uh, following on anthropometry came a very uh, uh, important development, uh, which I'll again just go on with because the, the slide shows this, of trying to uh, measure not facial angles but cranial capacity, that is the volume of the brain. This is what Samuel Morton tried to do. It's what a number of people tried to do to show that, in fact, uh, if you measure volumes, you get an array and a hierarchy of human beings, from the Australian in the Hottentot down here at 75 cc's to the Teutonic up at the top with 92 cc's, and to try to show that, in fact, this was a biological explanation for why uh, the northern Europeans were the leaders of civilization and society and why the Hottentots and the Australians were, uh, in fact, where they were. Well, what was eugenics? Eugenicists <coughs> saw their movement as the attempt to apply Mendelian genetics to improving the human hereditary stock. They made conscious analogies to animal and plant breeding all the time. And in fact, there's a famous eugenic cartoon, which I should have brought along, uh, which shows two people talking about the pedigree of their dog. And then one of them finally asks the other, well, but do you have pedigrees on your children? And the person says, no. And he says, well, you're neglecting your duty if you're so concerned about the pedigree of your dog to neglect the pedigree of your children. <laughs> Eugenicists saw their movement as drawing upon virtually every field of human knowledge. Genealogy, sociology, psychiatry, medicine, statistics, anthropology, genetics, biology, you name it. And all of these form the roots feeding into the eugenic tree. And of course, the flowering of that tree was the knowledge, the leafing, was the knowledge of applying these scientific and academic disciplines to proscribing various kinds of breeding practices for the human population. Now, how did eugenicists proceed? What kind of arguments did they use? What kind of biology and genetics, in fact, did they employ? Morally and ethically, it wasn't really possible for eugenicists to do that with human beings. While it was known by 1910 that there were some genetic traits in human beings that appeared to be inherited in a Mendelian fashion, uh, red-green color blindness, hemophilia, the ABO blood groups, uh, several metabolic diseases such as uh, phenylketonuria and alkaptonuria and so on, were all found to be genetically determined traits in human beings. This gave eugenicists a big boost to begin to investigate the kind of traits that they were interested in, which are <coughs> social behavioral traits. Now, the only way that eugenicists could really proceed was to construct what we call family pedigrees. Human beings are very bad organisms to work with if you're interested in genetics. Uh, not so today, because we have techniques for really analyzing uh, genetic differences on the enzyme levels today. We didn't have the, those weren't available in the early 1900s. Human beings are bad for a couple of reasons. You can't make any kind of planned matings. You have to take what is already there. And second, human beings have very few offspring. So you don't have any kind of statistical reliability. The best that you can do is to do family studies, look for the appearance or the reappearance of traits in several generations within a family, and try to deduce from the patterns of reappearance whether the trait, one, appears to be hereditary at all, and two, if it's hereditary, whether it's dominant, recessive, what its pattern is. So eugenicists went around studying, collecting information on uh, human family histories in an attempt to construct these pedigrees. This is a pedigree for epilepsy. And such pedigree information is useful. It is not by any means uh, bogus information necessarily. 
But its utility depends upon a couple of things. First and foremost, it depends upon being able to identify the trait with some degree of precision. Even epilepsy, which is a clinically definable trait, is not always easy to detect, especially in the early 1900s. Many people conceal the uh, occurrence of epilepsy in members of a family simply because it was uh, considered an embarrassing trait. Medical records were not all that complete. People have epilepsy but may only show uh, epileptic fits on very rare occasions, so it's sometimes very hard to tell whether an individual is or is not an epileptic. So it becomes difficult, one, to identify the trait, to agree upon the trait, does this individual manifest the trait or not? Second, it sometimes becomes very hard to get information that you can rely upon. If you do have reliability in both of those things, you can construct a family pedigree that may tell you something. Unfortunately, the eugenicists were by and large not interested in the kinds of traits that had clinical definability. They were interested in vague personality traits, social traits, for example, here, inherited scholarship. This is a family tree of the uh, family of <coughs> Timothy Dwight. And it goes back four generations uh, to show uh, the presence of individuals who had some kind of scholarly attribute. If you could read the legend down here, you would see that these dark squares are college presidents. Uh, these half dark squares are people who either were college presidents or faculty members in colleges. Uh, on down, people who wrote, uh, people of letters, uh, and so on. And you have all these various symbols. And the continual recurrence of uh, these traits in every generation was conclusive enough evidence for most eugenicists that scholarly ability was genetically determined. And they went on to make uh, arguments that, in fact, some family lines showed a great preponderance of scholarship, and they were the successful, the beneficial. They should be encouraged to have lots of children. Other family lines showed virtually no signs of inherited scholarship whatsoever, and they should be discouraged for having uh, children and so on. Of course, no one ever pointed out, uh, or people did point out, but no, the eugenicists didn't pay much attention to, uh, the fact that lots of things are socially inherited in families. For example, language. Uh, it is not a, a criterion for uh, genetic determinism to say that French-speaking people have French-speaking children. Uh, but in fact, uh, that was the kind of line of argument that uh, eugenicists used. Mm. Particularly prominent in the eugenicist thinking was their attacks on uh, the growing ranks of the, of the poor, of poverty-stricken, and of the feeble-minded. Uh, here from a, a, a little booklet that was published in Princeton, New Jersey in 1937, the uh, title of this picture is Four Generations in One Almshouse at One Time. And it shows, again, the, the typical pedigree uh, showing that this uh, inherited uh, disability, what is called pauperism uh, in early, 19th century, early 20th century terms, uh, was in fact passed right down the line. You can see the dark uh, circles or squares. Now, the American eugenics movement in particular uh, was headed from the early days of the 20th century onward by a man named Charles Benedict Davenport. In 1904, he persuaded the Carnegie Institution of Washington to establish what was called the Laboratory for the Experimental uh, Study of Evolution at Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island. In 1910, Davenport persuaded Mrs. E. H. Harriman of the Harriman family, the widow of the former head of Union Pacific Railroad, to found a second institution also at Cold Spring Harbor called the Eugenics Record Office. The Eugenics Record Office, headed by Davenport and his deputy Harry Laughlin, set up a research program to collect family information on as many types of people as it was possible to get information on uh, in uh, the various social and economic racial groups in the United States. It was meant to be a clearinghouse for genetic information about human beings, for publishing eugenic reports and recommendations, 
And until its closing in 1939, it became a major center for lobbying activities in an attempt to get various eugenically inspired legislation passed, both at the federal and at the state levels. The eugenics movement was initially supported by many leading biologists in the United States. Prior to the beginning of World War I, a number of bona fide laboratory geneticists, and by bona fide I mean people who did experimental work in genetics uh, as their uh, occupation, were in fact uh, strongly interested in trying to show that Mendelian genetics had some practical use as far as human uh, life was concerned. It wasn't merely a matter of breeding little bugs and mice and uh, guinea pigs. The movement was supported by some of the most well-known names in American biology, E.G. Conklin at Princeton, uh, T.H. Morgan at Columbia, Herbert Spencer Jennings at Johns Hopkins, W.E. Castle at Harvard, uh, E.A. Ross, a sociologist at Wisconsin, uh, David Starr Jordan at uh, Stanford, and so on. W.E. Castle at Harvard wrote a popular textbook called Genetics and Eugenics, which went through three editions. And Conklin used uh, his invitations to give a series of lectures in 1914 at Northwestern University to expound the eugenic cause. The picture shown here shows uh, several uh, American biologists at Cold Spring Harbor. From left is C.B. Davenport, who was the uh, chief eugenicist, but also a biologist of considerable uh, renown and a member of the uh, uh, then uh, just beginning uh, National Academy of Sciences. Next to him is Irving Fisher, who was an economist at Yale. Next to him, third from the left, is T.H. Morgan from Columbia. And on the far right is Alexander Graham Bell, who was a great patron of eugenics in its early years. Now, it's understandable why many members of the biological community would want to support this movement. It did, after all, show that their science uh, was useful. And as I tried to point out, there were traits that were investigatable, were clinically definable uh, in human beings that did seem to have a distinct genetic basis. However, the eugenicists, as I mentioned, were not willing to stop with clinically definable traits. Davenport, for example, tried to show that alcoholism seafaringness, degeneracy, and feeble-mindedness were each due to a single uh, Mendelian gene. Castle tried to argue that crosses between various human races might produce the same kind of a misfit hybrid as a cross between a thoroughbred and a draft horse. And Davenport even argued along the same lines that a cross between a white and a black would produce a disharmonious hybrid with the offspring possibly, and I quote, having the long legs of the Negro and the short arms of the white and thus having to stoop over more to pick up a thing off of the ground. <laughs> Eugenicists were interested in traits such as aesthetic and artistic ability from the collection of Harry Laughlin, which happens to be uh, housed in uh, a little college in upstate Missouri, uh, I found some very interesting photographs. Uh, this was, uh, Laughlin designed a series of tests, what were called aesthetic or artistic discrimination tests, to which children would be applied and they'd be scored on the test. Uh, this is the, uh, the artistic discrimination test. The child is presented with this little model of a house and movable uh, shrubbery and so on, and then asked to put the shrubbery where they would like to see it placed. And there were certain standard places if the child put the shrubbery in those places, they would be said to have uh, an artistic sense, and if they put them in other places or scattered them about uh, with no pattern, they would be said to have no or very little artistic uh, ability. And this kind of test was applied to hundreds upon hundreds of children. Another one that I found even more interesting in some sense was called the uh, aesthetic sense. And the child was confronted with a series of pelts of different kinds of furs and asked to stroke the fur and to tell which was the softest and which was some were, were cat and rat and some were mink and sable and very fine things. And the child was scored on whether they got the right answer or not on these uh, fur feeling tests. At any rate, it was this kind of thing that the eugenicists were interested in. In a way, it sounds like we're making a lot of fun of the eugenicists, as though they were kind of simple-minded people. In some ways, uh, they were awfully naive. Uh, 
On the other hand, they were motivated, many of them, by a very serious uh, desire to improve society and to eliminate social problems. The biggest difficulty was the kind of evidence that they sought to explain the cause of the social problem simply was not forthcoming in any of the data which they gathered. Chief among the traits which the eugenicists sought to show was genetically controlled was intelligence. And the fixation of eugenicists with the feeble-minded, the mentally degenerate, the morons uh, was uh, profound. Uh, as the phrase says here, see the happy moron, he doesn't have a care. His children and his problems are all for us to bear. The eugenicists became highly involved in the IQ testing movement, and that, again, is a story uh, in itself. I simply don't have time to go into that in any length. But to give you one example of the zeal, but perhaps the misplaced zeal, which the eugenicists employed, when Henry Goddard, who was a both a staunch eugenicist and a pioneer in the development in the uh, Binet uh, intelligence test, was invited to Ellis Island in 1912 by the Immigration Service to administer these sort of precursors of the uh, modern IQ test. He found imbecility to be in a very high proportion among the immigrants. 83% of the Jews, 80% of the Hungarians, 79% of Italians, and 87% of Russians were deemed uh, to be imbeciles and not fit for admission uh, to the United States. And as the Immigration Service was proud to show later, and Goddard himself uh, was proud to show that between 1912 and 13, and 1913 and 14, deportations uh, for failure to pass the mental test rose by some 570%. It is interesting to note that, of course, the tests were administered either in English or, for non-English speaking people, they were administered in pantomime. <laughs> when it was found after World War I that the immigrants who had been in the United States for 20 years did markedly better on the test than newly arriving immigrants, Carl Brigham, uh, who was, uh, had pioneered in the Army testing program of draftees during uh, the war, concluded that the results of this survey showed that the quality of immigrants was declining. <laughs> the racial biases of eugenicists were very pronounced. Eugenics was based from its inception on the notion of white Anglo-Saxon superiority. Galton, he tells us, was moved to study heredity by a desire to account for the recurrence of hereditary genius in his own family. And Galton once said, and I quote, there exists a sentiment, for the most part quite unreasonable, against the gradual extinction of an inferior race. The inherent uh, class racial bias of the eugenicists is, I think, perhaps nowhere more clear, clearly shown, than in this photograph from a eugenic publication. Again, that one published in Princeton in 1937. Uh, the, caption on the left-hand side, which is not too easy to read, this shows an immigrant family. The caption on the left-hand side says, why pollute America's bloodstream by letting these dregs of humanity multiply? By whatever standard, that is not a scientific kind of question. And the boundary between the science of Mendelian genetics and the conclusion of geneticists uh, was fuzzy indeed. The eugenicists, uh, well, excuse me, I'll come back to this slide in just a moment. What was the reaction of geneticists to the kind of statements that we saw made in the previous slide or in these exaggerations of saying that seafaring is what Davenport called blasophilia, uh, feeble-mindedness, alcoholism, criminality, uh, insubordination, uh, were genetic traits? What was the reaction of geneticists to that? Well, in the beginning, geneticists, uh, by and large, ignored such statements. But by about the time of World War I, a number of geneticists who had up to that time supported the eugenics movement withdrew their support. They withdrew their support largely in a quiet fashion. They resigned from eugenics organizations. They refused to publish in eugenic uh, uh, journals. Uh, they would not go to eugenic meetings, and so on. But very, very few of them, up until about the late 20s or early 30s, 
uh, made any kind of public statements against eugenics. So for the average reader who didn't look at the journal literature, there was no clear indication that geneticists, that biologically trained uh, laboratory people had lost, much, had lost faith in the scientific nature of this movement. The eugenicists, however, were unperturbed by the withdrawal of biological support. They went right on, in every way possible, popularizing their notions. And as the years went on, the eugenic organizations, including the center at Cold Spring Harbor, became increasingly concerned with what they called education, literally propaganda, as they call it. It was their own term. And with getting out the word, in other words, in trying to make an impact. Uh, they got a great deal of, of uh, popular display at uh, eugenic conferences, at state fairs. The eugenicists would turn up with their charts. Here's a display from Harry Laughlin's own collection. It's not a very uh, slick looking display, uh, but it makes uh, the point that eugenicists were trying to get out. How long are we Americans to be s so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle and then leave our an the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment? This was a display of one of the American Eugenic Society uh, exhibits, uh, which showed uh, there's a blank up at that top, that white card in the center with the, the black uh, circle in the center. The black circle is a little light. And it would flash on and off. And it said, every seven seconds, a defective is born. Uh, and so on. Each of these charts had a different uh, fl light flashing with different frequency, showing when a criminal was born, when a person of a high quality was born, and the noticeable difference was that the light for a person of high quality being born only went on something like every 10 minutes, whereas the other ones were flashing constantly. So it made a rather dramatic uh, impression. College courses began to treat eugenics. Uh, in 1914, the American Genetics Association boasted that already 44 colleges were teaching courses in eugenics. By 1928, they boasted that the number had swelled to 376. I looked into that a little bit. You have to be very distrustful of the eugenicists' own figures, I found out, because they uh, were quite willing to pad their estimates of their own success. By, out of that 376 courses, many were genetics courses, which had a week or two of lectures about eugenics or a unit on eugenics, but they were not full-scale courses for a whole semester in eugenics. But nonetheless, it was getting coverage and treatment in college courses on an increasing scale. Popular articles about eugenics were appearing uh, in slick magazines all over the place. If you look at, uh, just uh, we went through the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature and just looked at the uh, titles of articles listed under eugenics. You go back and look at them, almost all of them are pro-eugenics. Very, very few of them are negative eugenics. And the number of pro-eugenics articles uh, shot way up between about 1910 and 15, hitting their peak around 1912 or so on, and then maintaining a low but constant level uh, on up into the 20s and 30s. So by the, the time of World War I, the notion of eugenics, uh, while perhaps not a household word in a, car, in, in a general sense, was something that most people were familiar with in one way or another. It's very hard to tell that. I can't make that as an absolute historical assertion. Uh, but it appears that through the average channels of popularization that the notion that differences in uh, social differences in people, which were all to the fore anyway at that time, racial differences also might have some kind of biological basis. There were a number, a raft of books published in the teens and 20s about eugenics. Madison Grant, a wealthy New York lawyer, wrote a book called Passing of the Great Race in 1916, in which he lamented the uh, decline of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Lothrop Stoddard, in 1920, wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White Supremacy. I don't think the title itself is highly descriptive. Both, both books were based virtually on no genetic evidence at all, uh, but largely were airings of opinions uh, about uh, racism. Grant wrote, whether we like to admit it or not, the result of the mixture of two races in the long run gives us a race reverting to the more ancient, generalized, and lower type. The cross between a white man and a Negro is a Negro, and the cross between any of the three European races and a Jew is a Jew. Race feeling might be called prejudice, Grant said, but it was, and I quote, 
natural antipathy which serves to maintain the purity of the type. We go on and on and on with quotations uh, from these people, and I won't uh, bother you uh, with it. But the flavor is not untypical, and that's the point I'm trying to get across. The eugenics movement was highly organized. There were eugenic societies in most American cities. Uh, there were uh, eugenic journals. There were eugenic conferences. There were eugenic films. And the Better Baby contests and state fairs in the 1920s and 30s were, in fact, eugenics-inspired contests. There were eugenic Jenny couples contests at state fairs in which couples would enter and their physical measurements and their hereditary background would be compared and then one couple would be awarded the most eugenic couple, that is the two people who would have the greatest chance of producing high type of offspring. Now what is the political effect of eugenics? This was not a benign movement and I'd really like to close out the uh, talk with a dictum that may at first sound extreme, but I'd like to try to show why I don't think it's so extreme. I'd like to say that I think sometimes academics, while we're all impressed with the effects we think we might be able to someday have, we also tend to diminish the importance of ideas. We're a funny kind of schizophrenic about that. We think our ideas are pretty important, but we also quite frequently are willing to diminish our own importance. But I think ideas can have very significant effects, and indeed ideas can kill. One of the areas in which uh, eugenicists had some of their strongest uh, political effects was in the arena of immigration restriction and of sterilization laws. I'd like to talk about uh, the sterilization laws first. Going back to old studies of the Jukes family, which is something that become very prominent in the prominent case in the late 19th century. Uh, the eugenicists hit upon the notion that if Ada Juke in 1740, Ada Juke was a case uh, of a whole uh, been studied in which a large number of uh, descendants had been traced back to the illicit relationship between a, an 18th century woman and a, uh, a degenerate man who was named Old Horror. And out of uh, that liaison came a whole series of uh, degenerate descendants. Meanwhile, Ada Duke also had a liaison with an American Revolutionary War uh, uh, or Army officer from whom came a whole series of very high quality descendants. The point was that there was a hereditary nature uh, being manifest from the very beginning. And as the eugenicists tried to show, of the descendants of Ada Jukes, 92% were uh, of her liaison with old horror were in one way defectives. 64, uh, there were 64 mentally diseased, 174 sex perverts, 196 illegitimates, 142 paupers, 77 criminals and murderers, and so on. The point was, should we allow the Ada Jukes of today to continue the multiplication of misery? If Ada Jukes had been sterilized in 1740, the calculation went, it would have saved uh, future generations countless thousands upon thousands of dollars. Uh, in uh, 1937, this headline from the Sunday Oregonian uh, was a strict and pure eugenic argument. Uh, the status of sterilization laws for the eugenically unfit in the state of Oregon. And it shows uh, the typical pedigree showing that here's a case of two people who had uh, themselves were, men were mentally defective, having lots of offspring who passed on and multiplied this mental defectiveness throughout society. The eugenicists took on the, uh, in various state legislatures, the onus of trying to get past eugenic sterilization laws. And in many cases, they were quite effective. By 1935, uh, over 30 states in the United States had passed eugenic sterilization laws calling for compulsory sterilization of individuals declared to be eugenically unfit. Those decisions of who was eugenically unfit were made in different ways in different states. In some, for example, uh, they were made by uh, a court, by a judge in a court, sometimes by a uh, state board of health or some kind 
of the committee of doctors. In some cases, uh, they were made by uh, the, uh, the legal, legal system uh, itself. But in no cases uh, was uh, much in the way of real scientific evidence usually brought to bear. What were the characteristics that were said to be uh, uh, eugenically unfit for which a person could potentially be sterilized? Well, in Alabama, it was sort of being feeble-minded. Uh, in California, it's being feeble-minded, a habitual criminal, insane, an idiot, or a mental defective. Uh, in Connecticut, it was for being feeble-minded, habitual crim uh, sorry, uh, insane, an idiot, an imbecile, and those with inherited tendency to crime. Uh, in Indiana, it was hereditary, insane, feeble-minded, or epileptic. In Iowa, uh, right here, morally degenerate person uh, could be sterilized, and so on. The number of sterilizations uh, in the United States was, went up, uh, as you can see, from starting about 19, as of 1921, 25, 26, and so on up to 1935. Uh, the total cumulative number of sterilizations uh, by 1935 was about 21,000. Now it's interesting, the eugenicists claimed that uh, their laws were used all over the place. In fact, the data shows that they were used only in a few states. Uh, California had over half of this 21,000 uh, sterilizations. Uh, there were some states in which there were no sterilizations, even though the laws were on the books. So it's quite variable. One would be loath to conclude that uh, the sterilization laws opened a floodgate of sterilization across the whole country. The point was that there was a kind of mentality and argument that was being mounted to claim that the social problems of the people listed in that previous slide were genetically determined and therefore sterilization would, in fact, help to prevent that situation from being passed on to future generations. Probably the most effective, uh, the greatest effect that the eugenicists had was in the passage of a federal uh, immigration restriction law in 1924, the so-called Johnson Act, or as it later became popularly known as the uh, uh, Immigration Restriction Act. Harry Laughlin, the head of the uh, Eugenics Record Office, testified in over 600 pages worth of congressional uh, testimony over a period of several years uh, to the effect that various nationalities coming to the United States uh, carried with them defective genes, and that if, in fact, we did not want the moral uh, bloodstream of the United States to be diluted and polluted, that effective immigration and selective immigration restrictions should be uh, put forward. So by 1924, those arguments, among other economic and social arguments, had their effects. Uh, there was a glutting of the labor market after the return of uh, soldiers from World War I. There was a great need for finding some way to uh, justify cutting down on immigration since immigra open immigration had always been uh, a major policy of the United States. And the eugenic arguments were latched onto as a kind of justification, a kind of scientific justification for something that people felt had to be done uh, anyway. I think the important point that I'd like to end up with is that the eugenics movement did, by virtue of its uh, political impact, uh, have some very deleterious effects on people's lives, with the immigration uh, restriction in particular. It separated families, people who had come here uh, uh, were leaving their families uh, in Europe to bring them over a little bit later, were later unable to do so. In 1940, a particularly tragic uh, instance, uh, a, shape named, a ship named the St. Louis uh, brought a group of German refugees from uh, Germany, Jewish refugees, to uh, North America. First, uh, the ship went to Havana. Uh, they were denied entrance there. They were denied entrance to the United States on a quota basis uh, that derived from the 1924 law, and the ship was sent back to Germany. I think those kind of ideas have an enormous impact in the long run, but it's very hard to trace them out in a one-to-one -one basis. Harry Laughlin had direct contact with the Nazi race hygiene movement. He was awarded an honorary MD degree from the University of Heidelberg in 1936 by the Nazis explicitly for his work showing uh, that human races and human uh, uh, ethnic groups were uh, genetically inferior 
uh, and superior to one another, and that this was a scientific wave of the future. And I think it's important to recognize that the work that was done at Cold Spring Harbor in the United States, while perhaps not having its most dramatic impact on these shores, did have its rather dramatic impact at Dachau and the concentration camps and the ovens of the Nazi Holocaust. I don't mean to try to be sensationalist and to over-dramatize it, but I think the connection is important uh, to keep in mind. The connection is important because the theories of biological determinism or of scientific racism, whether we go back to the 18th century or to anthropometry, social Darwinism or whatever, have seemed to serve, at least in my analysis, a common kind of function in their own historical, each in their own historical era. One of those functions has been to, in some ways, justify the status quo. It's a long tradition in the Western uh, social thinking since the 17th century to try to argue that there is a natural basis for the social order, whatever that may be. But certainly to claim that the biological and inherent nature of people is the contributing factor to the order of society is a version of that rather general uh, intellectual and social trend. Theories of biological and scientific racism have, in fact, always supported uh, the status quo, as you've seen with each of the examples that I've tried to use. The, the groups which are the genetically most inferior, the in terms of Darwinian competition, most successful in terms of anthropometric measurements at the top of the scale are always the same people. But yet the sort of social and popularization of the movement goes on unabated. That popularization is what builds and wins support by, in some way or another, convincing the lay public that the authority of science is behind these ideas. But in every case, not only was the science bad, by its own standards, not by our day, by its own standards, Samuel Morton had his very strong critics in 1850 for his cranial capacity studies. The social Darwinists had their very strong critics in the 1870s. The eugenicists had their strong critics. Perhaps in some of these cases, the critics weren't vocal enough in a public way, but they had their very strong critics in their own day. The same is true of our modern versions, of Jensen, of Shockley, of sociobiology. Very strong criticisms within the scientific community. Yet, what gets popularized is not the criticism, not even the strong controversy, but rather the pro-scientific racism point of view. I made an interesting collection of popular articles on the Jensen case. Does everybody know what the Jensen case is? Uh, it's from 1969. Uh, the attempt to show statistically that uh, blacks and whites are genetically different from each other in intelligence, with whites being higher and blacks being lower. Strong criticism within the scientific community the raft of the, the list of articles attacking Jensen is three or four times as long as the list of articles by other people supporting his argument within the scientific community, within the scholarly community. When I looked at the popular articles, it was just the reverse. The same is also true with sociobiology. I don't know whether it's true with eugenics and social Darwinism. That's an interesting aspect of the historical study that I have yet to pursue. But it's an interesting reversal. And I'm not quite sure what it means, uh, but I have my guesses. A last general point about looking at some of these theories of biological determinism is their popularization phase tends to occur immediately during or following periods of social strife in whatever country or society they're talking about. And it's interesting to note that 
the social Darwinist movement, but particularly the eugenics movement, came on the heels of the most militant and most widespread labor union organizing in the United States, and to some extent in uh, Great Britain as well. And it's interesting to note also that the targets of the eugenicists were not so much the blacks in the United States as the Eastern European immigrants, and particularly the Jewish immigrants. And it's interesting also that a lot of those people were some of the instrumental organizers of American labor. They had brought their trade union experience with them from Central and Southern Europe. And it's also maybe not coincidental that the selectivity of the Immigration Restriction Act of 1924 was against Central Europeans and Jewish people. It made no restriction from England, from uh, northern Germany. Its aim was at Central Europe, the, uh, the southern Mediterranean countries. What I would like to suggest then, as I close, is that theories which attempt to explain social phenomena in terms of innate biological factors are, from the beginning, likely to be very suspect. If they become widespread and held as common beliefs in a society, they can do untold harm. Untold harm not simply because they might be unfair, but first and foremost because they're not true, because none of the science has been valid to prove anything of the sort that the claims have made. And it's on that basis, first and foremost, that the ideas can ultimately lead to an incredible amount of human injustice. Thank you.